Romans, the fourth chapter. Let's read from verse 17. I want to talk to you tonight about a subject that I believe is probably one of the most important subjects for the body of Christ today. And that is this, calling things that are not as though they were. Now, this is a biblical sound principle of the Bible. As we go into it and as we take a scriptural journey tonight, I'm going to share with you how that Jesus used it in all of his ministry. And you know, to criticize a principle of the Bible that Jesus used is to criticize God's word and Jesus himself. But now notice here, Paul, the apostle Paul is writing and he is quoting an Old Testament scripture from verse 17 of Romans the fourth chapter. He says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, Father, we ask you for the wisdom and anointing of your Holy Spirit to rise and live big within every person under the sound of my voice, whether they hear this in person or they hear it from the tape. Lord, that that anointing shall minister to the need of their life. For, Father, you sent your word and you healed them. And the word says you delivered them from their destruction. We fully expect the word to do that tonight, just as you have said in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Notice Paul says that God called things that were not as though they were. Now, not only did God do that, but Abraham did the same thing. Now, God taught Abraham to do it. He taught him to call for the thing that was not manifest. Now, if you allow me to add one word here where he says, call those things that be not, those things that are not manifest, as though they were manifest. In other words, he called them. He said, I have made you. Notice he didn't say, I am going to make you. He said, I have made you the father of many nations, before whom he believed even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. It was God that decided to do this. It was not man's idea. This was God's idea. And notice that when Abraham began to say what God said, it brought manifestation in his life. Now, I'm convinced that in the body of Christ today, there is not really a severe lack of knowledge of what God said sometimes. Now, in some areas, I suppose you could say that is a problem. But most of the time, in, let's say in full gospel circles, there's not a whole lot of problem with knowing what God said. But it's a matter of us getting in agreement with what God said and allowing the Holy Spirit to move within us to speak or to get in agreement with what God has said in his word concerning us. Now, Abraham had to make a decision. That was to believe God. Notice the, the, the 18th verse, speaking of Abraham, or Abram says, who against hope believed in hope. When there was no hope, naturally speaking. Now, there's some of you that may, the doctors may have told you there's no hope medically for you. In other words, maybe the doctor's done everything they can do for you. Maybe you got a bad report. The doctor says there's nothing we can do. Well, do like Abraham did. When there was no hope naturally, he went to the Word of God, to God's Word, and got him some hope. He made a decision to believe in it. Now, I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating. You don't always feel like believing God. You have to make a decision to believe God. And when it looked like all the cards were stacked against Abraham, and that it looked like he was, you know, when God first talked to him about the promised child, he was 75 years old. But before, well, before, before God talked to him here, when God talked to him in this instance, this is taken from the 17th chapter of Genesis, Abram was... 99 years old. And he still didn't have the promised child. Now, that was 24 years that passed from the time that God spoke the promise to Abram until he said, I have made you the father of many nations. I've already done it. As far as God was, was concerned, wasn't nothing else for God to do. 
He had decreed it and established it. But now, why did the promised child not come in the first 24 years? Abram even tried to help God out in the situation. Sarai, and he got together and decided that, that uh, maybe it was through the maid that he was going to have the promised child. So they tried to help God out and come up with an Ishmael, and we've been paying for it ever since. <laughs> but you see, 24 years came and went, and it seems that nothing is no, it is no closer to having the promise fulfilled than when, it first, when he first received the promise. Now what you need to realize is that because of that, God came on the scene when he's 99 years old, and he said, now, Abram, I'm going to change your name. It'll no longer be Abraham, Abram, but Abraham, which meant father of nations. Now, faith cometh by what? Hearing, Hearing the word of God. So Abram had to go, or Abraham had to go around and tell everyone, I am the father of nations. Now, that was calling things that were not. He was not physically in his present state, the father of nations. He didn't even have the promised child. But God said he had already done it. He had made him the father of nations. Now, Abram just fell in line with God and made the decision. That's why it says when there was no hope, Abraham made a decision to believe in hope. What hope did he have? None naturally. See, you may have no natural hope or medical hope about the disease the doctors say you may have and that it's terminal. Go to the Word of God and get you some supernatural hope. Find out what God said about healing, what God said about sickness and disease, and start saying the same thing. Whatever God said about you financially, begin to say that. I don't care what your bank book says. I don't care what your bank statement says. If it comes back with red ink all over it, go to God's word and proclaim what God said about you. I have given it is given unto me. Now you have to make a decision to do that. I can't do it for you. Someone has made this statement. He said, it seems like God will pass over a million people to just get to someone that's believing him and agreeing with him. And that's true. If you want to see a miracle happen in your finances or in your physical body or in your marriage, begin to proclaim what God said about you when it looks like that all hell is broke loose and nothing will work. Say what God said. Somebody said, I sure feel foolish doing that. Well, you may feel foolish, all right, but you'll get the results God said you'd have. See, folks, you've got to make a decision to do these things. It's not going to happen just because God said it, but we have to get in agreement with it, and we have to say these things. We have to prove that we believe God and simply proclaim what he says. Now, what God did in this instance was simply implement the law of faith in Abram's life. That was that faith cometh by hearing. That's the way it comes. So every time he said, I'm the father of nations, or I am Abraham, he was saying, I'm the father of nations. Every time someone said to him, Abraham, where do you want to put the sheep? He didn't hear Abraham. He heard father of nations, father of nations. Now, here's the point. It only, after he changed his name, it was only about nine or ten months, maybe twelve months, before the promised child came. For 24 years it didn't come to pass. But when Abram started saying what God said, and actually God kind of forced him into it. The Bible says God preached the gospel first to Abraham. Boy, that was good news to Abram <laughs> when he found out that he was the father of nations. Whether you look like it, feel like it, or whether you believe it or not, God had said it, and Abraham just finally got himself in agreement with it, began to say it. Now, I'm telling you some things that the Bible teaches, but not only am I telling it to you by knowledge, I'm telling it to you by revelation and by experience also. Now, I do not teach experience alone. If an experience does not agree with the Word of God, forget it. That's the reason that many times I don't, I don't go into the examples and things where I've applied the Word of God. Now, sometimes the Lord leads me to do that. 
I may share some things tonight along that line. But I don't want you to get your faith in my experience. I want you to have your faith in the Word of God and the principle of the Bible. See, there's principles in the Word of God. If you grasp this principle tonight that we're talking about, it will answer almost any problem or question that you have in life down through the years. You can obtain the answer through this method of calling things that are not. For instance, if you need the wisdom of God concerning a matter, what does the Word say about it? James said, chapter 1, verse 5, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, that's what God's word said about it. Now, I shock people sometimes when they come to me and they say, Brother Caps, oh, I've got to have the wisdom of God. Can you just, uh, what, would you pray with me? I said, well, how about you praying and me getting agreement with you? And I just opened it to James. I said, now, here's what James says. Now, you do exactly what he says, and we're going to agree that you have the wisdom of God. And God said he'd give it to you if he asked for it. And when you leave this place, don't you ever let it come out of your mouth that you don't know or don't have the wisdom of God. Because once you ask for it, believe that you receive it. Then you go around and say, thank God I have the wisdom of God. Somebody said, how do you know you have the wisdom of God? Because the Word said so. He said, if I ask, I'll receive. Thank God I ask, I receive. Somebody said, well, what are you going to do? I don't know physically. I don't know mentally right now what I'm going to do. But when the time comes to make that decision, I will do exactly what I'm supposed to do. I have the wisdom of God. Somebody said, what if the decision time comes and you do not know up here what to do? Very simple. I close my eyes and say, what is it I want to do? If God hadn't revealed anything to me, if there has not come any revelation, then I search my heart and say, what do I really want to do in my heart? And whatever it is that is in my heart is the wisdom of God. Amen. Now somebody said, Brother Caps, you make it too simple. I didn't make it simple. <laughs> Jesus did. <laughs> The Word of God, the, the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, these guys, they did this by the anointing of the Spirit of God. And I've had people to just say, oh. <laughs> they thought I was going to wave a magic wand over them and say, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Some people want to be prophesied to what color tie to wear at a church, you know. <laughs> you don't have to be prophesied over on everything. Just ask your wife. She can tell you. <laughs> They're full of free advice. <laughs> and most of the time, they're right. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> Praise God. Now, see, what I'm saying is that when you call for something, see, you call for wisdom and you didn't have it, did you? You asked for it. So you call for it, then you start confessing that I have it because I've asked and I believe I received. Now you do that in any area of life. Now turn with me to, to, to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and listen to the, the Apostle Paul as he shares concerning this. In verse 27, But God has chosen, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 27, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Now, did you get that? You missed a good place to shout. God has chosen things that are not, not what, not manifest, not revealed to the five physical senses, things that are not apparent to the eye, to bring to naught, that means reduced to zero, things that are manifest in the natural realm. Now, God chose this method. I didn't choose it until after God chose it. But because God chose it, I chose it because I tell you what, I found out it works. You know, I don't know. When, when I saw this and began to 
operate in it just in small things. And, and I, I would advise you to do this. Begin to operate in these things on your level. I see so many people that want to start calling $5 billion, you know, and haven't learned God, to believe God for the dollar yet or to pay their light bill, you know. Well, you get overloaded in your faith. You've got to start where your level is, where you can believe. There's a lot of people out there trying to build a third story on a vacant lot. You just can't do that. <laughs> and it seems like sometimes when people get turned on to faith, they do crazy things sometimes. You have them writing faith checks. Well, I'm calling things that are not. Yeah, you are, and you're going to end up in jail <laughs> if you're sending that check off. That's not a faith check. That's a hot check. <laughs> you even got people saying, I'm going to cast the calories out of this pie. You're going to get fat. <laughs> but now I can tell you how you can get the calories out of that pie. Every one of them. You can get every one of them out of it. Eat it. You'll get every one of them. <laughs> but don't be a kooky Christian. Now listen to what I'm saying. Call for the things that are not. You can say, well, the bills do. I'm going to... I'm going to call it in. I'm going to proclaim that I have abundance. It's all right to sit down and write the check. But don't mail it until you get the money in the bank. Amen. Are you listening to me? You wouldn't have corresponding action any further than you had manifestation. Now, that's where people miss it. They go further than they have the manifestation. They say, God's got to put the money in the bank because I've already sent the check, so God's got to perform. Now, you'll be in jail before God puts the money in the bank. <laughs> Now, I know you ought not have to say these things, but you do. See, it's not you folks that are here. It's some of those out there watching the TV that I'm talking to. <laughs> you ought not have to say these, but you do need to say these, really, because uh, if, if no question is dumb if you don't understand. So we say it so many different ways. I, I was teaching like this in a seminar in a certain city, and, and a guy came to me, and he said, Brother Caps, I want to tell you how much I appreciate what you said. He said, I was one of them that was writing the faith checks. And he said, I thought I was having corresponding action to my faith. I didn't know that I was being ignorant. So don't be a kooky Christian, okay? Now, Paul says, God has chosen this method. Things that are not to bring to naught things that are. Now, now, allow me again to put a word in there. Things that are not manifest to bring to naught things that are manifest. In other words, spiritual forces. The earth was created with the Word of God. God's Word created the earth. You can't see words that came out of God's mouth. It was His faith-filled words that created the universe. God stood there and He looked out and He saw darkness. He knew it was dark. But He said, light. And light came. Why? Because God called it. Isn't that amazing? God called it and it came. This is the method that God has chosen. Things that are not to bring to naught things that are. Now, what happened to the darkness when he called light? It had to leave, didn't it? Darkness is absence of light. When light comes, darkness does not exist. So you call the thing that is not there. Now, somebody said, well, I can understand that, but you see, that's God. Well, if you read Genesis, you find out he said that he would let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, how was them going to have dominion? The same way that him had dominion. <laughs> now, I realize that's not good English, but it'll help you understand it. He expected Adam to speak faith-filled words and subdue the earth. Well, God wants us to get a hold of this principle. Paul talks about it here. God has chosen things that are not to bring to naught things that are. Now, one of the problems in the area of faith is that people have misunderstood. And I, and I think probably some of it's our fault, the teacher's fault, because sometimes we, we left some things unsaid. When you leave things unsaid, people read between the lines. And sometimes what they read between the lines is what gets them in trouble. So I think all the, the ministers have been saying things that they've left unsaid because... 
See, what I do, uh, used to do, and, and I'm changing that, is I assume that who I was talking to knew what I meant. <laughs> well, you've got to explain it about five different ways, you know, so that they don't miss it. And then they'll get it because they don't always understand. They don't hear what you said. They heard what they thought you said. And it's what they thought you said sometimes that gets them in trouble. And they go out and do foolish things and call it faith. Now, let's put it down on a level where you can understand it. God says to call, God call things that were not as though they were. Now, let's say in the, in the realm of healing, for instance, if I were sick, had the flu or something, you might hear me going around the house saying this, thank God I'm healed, I'm delivered from the authority of darkness, I'm calling my body well. Body, listen to me, I'm talking to you, you are well in the name of Jesus, I'm calling you well. Thank God I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'd quote First Peter 2.24 and all the healing scriptures, thank God my body is well. You might overhear me and go away and say, that old boy don't have a pain in his body. Well, I might be hurting all over. Somebody said, well, how can you say that when you hurt? It's easy. Just open your mouth and begin to talk. Amen. Well, you'd just be lying. No, I'm calling things that are not. Why would I want to call something that's already there? Somebody said, well, if you're sick, you've got to say you're sick. Well, now, who says you have to say that? Now, now here's the point. I'm not saying deny what exists. Confessing God's word or calling things or not is not denying what exists. You see, when you deny what exists, you're calling things that are as though they are not. I'm not calling things that are as though they are not. I'm calling things that are not as though they were. Now, some of you missed it. By midnight, you'll get it and your hair will stand up like mine. <laughs> take you four days to get it calmed down. <laughs> no, there's no power in denying what exists. There's no power in me saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. You can't get healed by just saying, I'm not sick. But yet, you don't want to go around confessing to everybody that I'm sick and I always have the flu this time of year. I've been expecting it for four months. <laughs> like one fellow came in, the <laughs> he came in the the barber shop where I was getting my hairstyle. And, uh, well, now, what are you laughing about? He said, I've been trying to take the flu for three weeks. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, you ought to have it. You've been trying to take it three weeks. Why didn't you spend three weeks trying to resist it? But see, he didn't know what he said. He didn't realize what he said. You don't have any revelation of it. No, there's no power in denying what exists, but yet you don't want to always be establishing what is. You understand what I'm saying? You don't want your faith in what you have, and faith cometh by hearing. You continually say, I'm sick. I always get sick this time of year. If I ever eat that, it always makes me sick. You have great faith in sickness. And God didn't have nothing to do with it. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about calling for healing that you don't have. You don't have healing. If you're sick, you are not healed. But you're calling for it. So I call it as though it were. Thank God I am healed. Somebody said, you lied. No, I'm calling things that are not as though they were. I'm calling as, as though it were already done because my Father God taught me to do that. So I call myself, well, now, if someone comes up and says, how do you feel? And I'm just hurting all over, and I say, oh, I feel fine. I didn't make a confession. I lied. <laughs> Are you listening? Now, see, sometimes people thought, well, now, I've got to deny it or I'm not in faith. No. You see, everything you say is not a confession. I've had people come in the ministry line, and I wanted to know how to pray for them. And they said, I, I, I won't say it. I don't want to make a bad confession. Well, just telling me what the problem is is not a bad confession. That's just transmitting some knowledge to me so I'll know how to pray and believe with you. You understand what I'm saying? But a confession is something you continually say over and over and over. Well, every time I eat that, it makes me sick. That's a confession. See? And if you continue to say that, you will get sick every time you eat it. 
Now, if you don't believe that, start saying the opposite of that. Say it for 30, 60, or 90 days, then eat it and see what happens. You'll be amazed. I'd say 99% of the time it will not affect you if you'll go 90 days and saying that that does not affect, start proclaiming what God's Word said about it. See, we build these things in our system. Now, if I'm saying, thank God I'm healed, I'm not trying to convince you that it don't hurt. I'm just calling things that are not. I'm calling it. See, like Abraham was forced to say that he was the father of nations when he didn't have the promised child. The reason I'm calling healing is because I don't have it. That's why I call it. Now, let's put it over in there. What happens when I call healing into manifestation? What happened to the sickness of the flu? I don't know, and I don't care, because the healing took the place of it. Amen. See, God always puts something in the place of it. Now, if I could deny sickness and get rid of it, say, if I denied I had the flu, and I could get rid of it that way, I might die with an growing toenail. Or cancer or something. Now, see, that's not the answer, is it? I mean, you might get rid of one, but you might have another. But if you call healing and health into your body, then it takes care of the whole thing. Now, let's move it over into another area. Let's put it in the area of finances. Let's say that an individual, let's, uh, well, let's say Brother Bob here decides he's going to buy him a car. Now, if he can sell his car for so much money, he have enough money to buy this car. And uh, so he prays, asks God to send him a buyer for his car. And the word says, what's everything you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. So, Father, he says, I believe I received a buyer. So, thank God. Uh, he misunderstood the faith message. He says, thank God, I'm just going to say I don't have a car because I believe I've sold it. Somebody says, how's your car, Bob? Oh, I don't have a car. <laughs> thank God, don't have a car, don't have a car, don't have a car. Thank God, don't have a car. Wakes up some morning, somebody stole his car. <laughs> and he don't have a car. And neither does he have the money. Now, see, there's a severe backlash to denying what exists. But now the, the key is to follow God's direction and his principle. Call things that are not as though they were. Now, what's the key? Call the car sold. You know, God has a sense of humor. I had a guy from Kansas write me and said, Brother Caps, I was driving through Kansas. And he said, I don't even know what radio station it was. But he said, I'd been trying to sell my car and had it up for sale for two or three weeks or a month. Hadn't had an offer on it. And he said, I'm questioning the Lord. Lord, why haven't I sold my car? I prayed, I believed you, I've done all this stuff, you know. And he said, all the time I was trying to tune in to a Christian radio station. And he said, I don't know what station I got, but he said, I got your program. And he said, you was teaching on calling things that are not. And the first phrase I got when I tuned into the station, you said, I can tell you why you hadn't sold your car, you hadn't called it sold. <laughs> he said, now, if you don't think that'll jerk the slack out of your chain. <laughs> you ask God a question and turn the radio on and somebody answers it right over the radio. And he said, brother, I started talking to my car and calling it sold. He said, I sold it the next week. Now, as I said in the beginning, I'm not telling you these experiences to get you to have faith in somebody else's experience, but to show you that it works in everyday life. A lady from Minneapolis, Minnesota, I was teaching a seminar there several years ago. She said to me, Brother Caps, after I'd taught the night on the subject I'm talking here, she said, I've had my house up for sale for so many months now and, and hadn't had an offer on it. And that was back when the houses were hard to sell. She said, uh, oh, I can't wait to get home. I'm going to go talk to my house. I'm going to call it sold. And she said, now, when I sell it, I'm going to send you the tithes of your ministry. I'm going to send the tithes of the prophet um, to your ministry. Well, I was home two weeks and got a check for $500. She sold the house the next week. Now, it had been on the market for, I don't know, several months. Isn't it amazing that after she talked to it, after she did what Jesus said to do. Now, see, this is a principle not only of what Paul talked about, but Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to the mountain, be removed. See, her mountain was a house. She said to it, Your soul. She called it removed. Even though it wasn't removed, she could see it wasn't removed. It's still there, just as big as ever, but she called it. The buyer bought it the next week. 
Now, I, if I write all these things down, I could spend the whole night telling you experience it like, but I don't want you to believe in the experience. I want you to believe in God's Word and what He said in the principle because it'll work for you in your, in your life. Now, Jesus said concerning the sycamine tree in the 17th chapter of Luke, He said, if you had faith as a seed, you would say to the sycamine tree or to the obstacle before you, you would say to it, be plucked up by the root, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Jesus said, talk to it. In other words, when you say to something, you're going to be removed, you're not going to hinder me anymore, you're calling things that are not. Mark eleven twenty three is a principle of calling things that are not. You say the mountain's moved, but the mountain is not moved. You can see the mountain. The mountain is still there, but you're calling it. Now, do you realize that every time a farmer plants a seed, he is calling for things that are not? He plants corn. He does not want one grain of corn. He wants a lot of corn. So he plants one seed, and it'll produce a stalk that'll raise about two ears on it and have a lot of corn on it. He does not want one grain of corn. So he calls for what he doesn't have. He'll plant a thousand bushels of corn, but he'll expect to get a hundred thousand bushels. Why? He's calling for it. It's God's principle. It's God's law. So don't get it mixed up with denying what exists. It's not denying what exists. It's far beyond that. And not only that, it is not just mind over matter, as some would imply. It's as far as the east is from the west from mind over matter. It's God's word and your faith over all matter. And the, and the faith comes from the word of God, see. So when we call things that are not manifest, we're calling it. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because the word said to do it. See, do it because of the word. Don't do it because of my experience. I'm just giving you an example so you will know how it will work in everyday life. But don't base your faith in what I did. Base your faith in what the Word of God said concerning that. And then when you do it, you release your faith in it. Now, in sickness, you would call your body well. Thank God I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm free. Confess it. Now, it won't happen overnight. See, I had ulcers several years ago, worried myself sick about my finances, and didn't have any finances to worry about. <laughs> that was a crazy thing to do. But you see, I got a hold of this principle of calling things that are not, and I started calling my body well. In fact, I've been preaching at times. I remember, I don't remember where it was. I was teaching one night, and, and the symptoms of that ulcer hit me right there in the stomach, and I hadn't had it in years, and... and I just slapped myself just like this, and I said, stop it in the name of Jesus, and went right on. I never did explain to the people what I was doing. <laughs> I know they wondered, what in the world is this guy doing? You have to talk to your body. Let me tell you something about your body. Your body's like a child. It'll do anything you'll let it do. Sometimes it just wants to be sick for about three days. And if you let it, it will be. Learn to get on the symptoms just as soon as you have them. Don't go around for three days saying, wonder what I got. <laughs> because just sure as you do, the devil get his little flip chart out and he say, would you believe? <laughs> and he'll find something that you will believe. And then as you have believed, so shall it be unto you. And you go tell somebody, did you know I have so-and-so? Pretty soon you got 50 people believing you got, you know, some ridiculous thing. And Jesus said, if two of you agree. So you get more people in agreement. Now, just denying it does not do away with it. There's no power in denying it. But yet, what I'm saying is you don't want to go around always confessing things that hinder you because you'll have faith in them when you do that. See, Jesus said, say to the mountain, you won't hinder me any longer. Be removed and be cast into the sea. And believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, and he shall have. What will he have? He'll have whatsoever he saith. Now listen to me. It's not the saying it that makes it happen. It won't work just because you say it. But yet saying it 
is involved in working it. Now, I'm going to say that again. It won't work just because you say it. But saying it is involved in working the principle. Now, you understand what I'm saying? See, a lot of people say, well, I said it three times, and it didn't happen. You really hung in there, didn't you? <laughs> three big times. Faith cometh by hearing. Now, I'm not talking about just going out here and just start confessing anything and everything, like someone did, said, oh, I'm confessing that so-and-so will marry me. Well, the individual said, does so-and-so want to marry you? Well, no, said he's already married, but, but you know... <laughs> That makes you wonder about folks like that. You wonder when they get up in the morning, how do they find the floor? <laughs> you think they jump off on the wall, you know, just sliding down the wall. No, we're talking about finding a promise in the Word of God. The things that God has given us. And you look in the Word of God and you find that if you give, it will be given unto you. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. And uh, you find all these promises, and you say, well, they're not true in my life. Well, start calling them. Well, how can I say that my needs are met according to his riches in glory when the rent's due and I don't have the money? It's easy. Just open your mouth and say, thank God, because I've given, it's given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, that's not too hard. Yeah, but I feel like I'm lying. How could you lie saying what God said? But now let me explain something. Don't wait till the rent's due before you start saying it. Now let me say it again. It doesn't work just because you say it. You must believe, doubt not in your heart, and believe what you're saying will come to pass. Then you call the thing that God promised you. Now, see, a lot of the criticism of the faith message is that, well, you're just teaching people to, to, to be lustful after things. We're talking about calling things that God has given you. Was it wrong for the children of Israel to want to possess the promised land when God gave it to them? No. Then all that God has given you, he wants you to enter into the provision. Now, if you don't have the provision call for it. It's just that simple. That's God's method. Call for the thing that you don't have. There's no need to call for what you already have. You know, sometimes people say, well, I'm sick though. How can I say I'm healed? I always get sick this time of the year. I tell you what, when the flu comes around, I'm the first one to get it. Man, you got it. Quit calling it. Don't call it anymore. Now, I don't mean deny what exists. Just call for the thing that you don't have. You don't have healing, so call for it. Now, see, understand, this is a process. You're not going to just say it and, and have it in the morning or in the next five minutes. Folks, this is a way of life. This is not a fad. This is not something you just do when you feel like doing it and then just go back to the old way. This is a way of life. It's why that Jesus, when he spoke things... They came to pass quickly because he was highly developed in believing what he said would come to pass. Now, see, Jesus operated in this in all of his ministry. And at, at the uh, marriage of Cana of Galilee, they had no wine. And he said, fill the water pots with water. Now, Peter knew there was water in those pots. Jesus knew there's water in the pots. John knew there's water in the pots. But Jesus said, bear out now, dip out now, and carry it to the governor of the feast. And I can just see old John saying, you do it, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, he can lift my head for carrying him water and telling him it's wine. But you know, when he got there with it, it was wine. Now what was Jesus doing? He was calling the water wine. The very fact that they dipped that water out of there and started to the governor, with the first step they took, they were calling it wine. It wasn't wine. It was water. H2O. Now, don't get the idea. Like I said, you ought not have to say these things. Jesus is not teaching you to try to turn every jug of water into wine. The guy 
stopped on the freeway. Policeman said, what you got in that jug? Oh, he said, that's just a jug of water. He said, let me a smell of that. He picked it up and he smelled it and took a little swig. He said, well, that's wine. He said, thank you, Jesus. You've done it again. <laughs> no, Jesus didn't done it again. But you see, somebody will hear this now. If you don't say these things, they'll say, bless God, I'm going to turn the water holes in my gas tank and call it gas. Yeah, and you're going to spend $50 getting your tank drained. Don't be a flake. <laughs> now, if it was necessary, emergency had arisen, might be a different situation. See, I was telling similar to this in a church one night, how that I flew my airplane five hours and 25 minutes, and it didn't hold but four hours and a half fuel. And I got lost out in the northwest part of the country and got some weather. I flew it five hours, 25 minutes. My brother had already called in and said, well, he's down somewhere because he's out of gas. Well, I come sailing in, landed, you know, and then when I turned, filled it up, and still had 17 gallons of gas in the tank. And the old boy that filled it up, he just shook his head. He said, they just burned more than that. Well, they always did before and they always did after, but it didn't that time. Now, I'm telling this in a church one night, and the guy gets up out of church. He goes out, and they get in their car and start home. And his wife said, we better get some gas. He said, no, God put gas in Brother Caps' airplane. He'll put it in my car. <laughs> Had the money in his pocket, drove by the filling station. The filling station's open, drove five miles out in the country and run out of gas. That's dumb. <laughs> Call the pastor, and the pastor had to go get him. Now, that's why we say these things. Now, let's put this down on a level where you can understand it. I'm going to say this as many ways you're going to get it. People say, I've had them to write me and say, Brother Caps, I don't believe in calling things or not. I don't believe in, I believe in saying it just like it is. I mean, I just believe in saying it like it is. Well, now you just follow that individual and see if he really believes that. The only time he believes that is on Sunday. Because on Monday morning, he'll go out to feed his dog. And his dog is not there. And he'll stand right there on the porch and say, Here, Pooch! Here, Pooch! Here, Pooch! And Pooch is not here. <laughs> Pooch is yonder somewhere. But now remember, he doesn't believe in calling things that are not. At least he didn't on Sunday. But Monday morning, he's standing on his porch calling things that are not. Now, what's the difference? He's hypocritical in his attitude toward the Word of God and the principles of the Bible. Now, he'll tell you flat out you're lying if you call your body well when you're sick. But he'll turn around and call the pooch here when pooch is yonder. Now, see, if he really believed what he says, he'd go out there and he'd sit down on the porch and he'd say, pooch is not here. <laughs> Pooch is gone. Oh, I wish the dog was here. Oh, I, wish, I guess it's not God's will for Pooch to be here. Oh, I wanted to feed Pooch. And his neighbor comes over and says, what are you doing? Well, I was going to feed Pooch, but he's gone. My dog's gone. Oh, I wish my dog was here. His neighbor says, have you tried calling the dog? Huh, you must be that faith bunch. <laughs> you can't call things that are not, and Pooch is not here. <laughs> now, if some guy did that, you'd know instantly his elevator didn't go all the way to the top. <laughs> but he won't do that. He'll stand there and call the dog, and the dog is gone. But he calls him here. Why in the world would you want to call the dog if he's there? Now, see, if he really believes what he believes, if he goes out there 
and he wants to feed the cat, and the dog is there. Well, he'd sit down and start calling the dog. Here, Pooch, here, Pooch, here, Pooch. And Pooch is licking him in the face. <laughs> and he just keeps calling him. And his neighbor comes over and says, What are you doing calling the dog? Well, I want to feed the cat. <laughs> well, if you want to feed the cat, why do you call the dog? Because you've got to say it like it is, and the dog is here, so i got to call the dog. You've got to call it like it is, and the dog is here, so I call the dog. Now, that's dumb. <laughs> Nobody would be that foolish in the natural. Why would we want to do that when it comes to the promises of God? I've had people say, well, I'll tell you, I'm not prospering, and I gave, and it's not given unto me. I tell you, every time I save any money, why, the kids all come down sick, and we had to spend every dime on doctor bills. It happens every time. Hey, man, the dog is licking you in the face. Quit calling him. You're calling what you already have. Don't call what you have. Call what you don't have. What you don't have is abundance. What you don't have is healing. What you don't have is the blessing of God. Quit centering up on what you do have and call what you don't have. And when you get what you don't have, what you do have will vanish. Can you see that? That's what Paul, wasn't that what Paul said? No, it's not a matter of denying what exists. It's a matter of calling something else in place of that which did exist. And it nullifies it. It causes it to, to disappear. When you call abundance, what happens to lack when abundance comes? Now let me show you how the backlash of denying things. Even if you could get, if there was power in denying something. See, you get into a mind science there about denying things, you know. It's like somebody that was saying, you know, their sister was sick, and somebody said, well, you know, they, they believe that they, it's all in their mind. They said, well, she thinks she's sick. And uh, a few days later, asked about her, well, I said, now she thinks she's dead. <laughs> it's all in her mind. But no, it wasn't in her mind, it's in her body too, see. But we're not talking about that, see. This, this is as far as the East is from the West from that. Now, we've been accused of that, teaching Christian science and everything else in the world, you know. But it's not Christian science. Like Brother Hagin says, Christian sense. <laughs> There's some things that we need to understand about God's principle. Now, God's not wrong about it. I could be wrong about some things. But God is not wrong about these things. And when Jesus operated in the principle... He proved that it worked in every phase of life. And when you will work it, it'll work the same way. Now let's take, for instance, if a guy decided to say, well, I'm going to get out of debt, and I'm going to owe nobody nothing, and I'm going to be out of debt. So he's, he, he, if he misunderstood what we was teaching, he might go around saying, I don't owe anybody anything. Thank God I don't have any debts. Don't have any debts. Now he may owe everybody in the county. Well, now if he could get out of debt by saying that, which he can't. There's no power in denying it. But if he could get out of debt by saying he didn't have any, he might die of starvation. Because you could be out of debt and not have any groceries. Did you know that most people that die of starvation don't owe anybody anything? So that's not the answer. What is the answer to it? See, the answer is to call what you don't have. Now, what he's after is abundance. Not just to get out of debt. That's not the answer to it. The answer is abundance. When you get out of debt, or call abundance into manifestation, and you call it by calling the promise of God. Now, that doesn't mean you live like the devil every day of the week and call for the blessing of God. That won't work. Amen. Folks, you have to live the Word of God. Right. And sometimes we've left that unsaid. But you need to live right. Because if you don't, you'll have a spiritual heart attack when you start calling the, the blessings of God. And somebody said, what do you mean a spiritual heart attack? Well, your heart will condemn you and your faith won't work. You see, you can't abuse the law of faith. There's just no way to do it. Because if I pray that you'll lose your billfold so I can find it and get your money, why, how in the world could I have faith for that? That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? 
See, my heart would condemn me because I know it's wrong. I couldn't believe for that no way in the world. And when people don't live right and don't keep the, the promises of God and do the Word of God, when they pray, their faith doesn't work. You've got to live the Word of God. And I'll tell you, we need, to, we need to, you know, shape up in some of these areas because that's why a lot of times we don't have any confidence in our, our prayer. We have confidence in somebody else's prayer. But I'll tell you if, you, if you get things straightened out between you and the Lord, you'll have faith in your praying. Now, the Word of God is very implicit in this matter. Jesus, when, when they sent down there to Jesus and said, He whom thou lovest is sick, Lazarus, whom thou lovest is sick. You know what Jesus said? He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. Now, what is Jesus saying? What do you mean this sickness is not unto death? You read a few verses later on there, and you find out that the man died. What are you going to do with Jesus? Did Jesus lie about it? See, they accuse us of lying when we proclaim something that's not already come to pass. No, Jesus is saying the end results of this matter will not end in death. The end results will bring glory to God. It wasn't the sickness that glorified God. It wasn't the death that glorified God. It was the resurrection that glorified God when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, he starts down there. He stays two days still in the same place. And then he walks down there, which takes him a day. That's three days. And when he gets down there, they say, Lord, he's been dead four days. Now, see, took the runner a day to get there. Jesus stayed two days, it's three days, and it took Jesus' day to walk down there, it's four days. So the man was dead when the runner got there and told Jesus. And no doubt Jesus knew it, because when they started down there, he said, Lazarus sleepeth. And they said, well, Lord, if he's asleep, he's doing well. And he, he understood that they misunderstood him. So he explained to them that Lazarus died. Now notice, Jesus said, Lazarus sleepeth. What's he doing? He's guarding his conversation where he does not undo what he had already established that the end results of this will not be death. The end results will bring glory to God. And he says, Lazarus sleepeth. Now when he gets down there, he lifts his eyes toward heaven. He said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He hadn't said anything yet. Oh, but he did four days ago. He said, this sickness is not unto death. The end results of it will not bring death. He's reminding the Father of what he said four days ago. Folks, if you will establish some things according to the Word of God, when faith is high, then when the storm hits, rest in what you established back there. Point back to that part where you believe God and your faith was high. Sometimes it's hard to believe God in the storm. Rest in that faith. Then he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, for I knew that thou hearest me always. Notice past tense. He was referring back to the four days. Then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And thank God he did. And all the embarrassment's gone. Now watch Jesus as he goes through his ministry. He walked into the temple one day, and there's a man with a withered arm. And he said to the man, Stand up! The old boy stood up in the midst, and I always see, I don't know why, I always saw his right arm all withered and twisted like this. And he said, stretch forth your hand. What do you mean? A crippled man can't stretch forth his hand. But a well one can. He called the man well when he said, stretch forth your hand. He's calling things that are not. He went down to the pool of Bethesda. There's a man that's crippled. He said to the man, rise, take up your bed and go home. You know and I know and Jesus knew that a crippled man cannot rise and carry his bed, but a well man can. He called the man well. He walked up to a little woman one day that has all been over in the 13th chapter of, of Luke. And he said to the woman, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. But she wasn't. She was just as crippled as she ever was, still just bowed together. But what's he doing? He's calling her well. And then he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. 
Now this is Jesus operating in the principle of calling things that are not. Then one day there was ten lepers afar off, and they said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And he stopped, and he looked over there, and he said, go show yourself to the priest. Now the law says that if you've been cleansed, go show yourself to the priest. They could have said, but Jesus, we're lepers. But the Bible says as they went, they were cleansed. What would have happened if they hadn't went? I know that's not good English, but you need to understand. It was the first step that they took toward the priest's house. They were calling themselves well. Jesus called them well when he looked at him and said, Go show yourself to the priest. He's calling them clean, but they were not clean. But they were when they started to the priest's house. When they took the first step, they called themselves clean. The man that was on the bed of affliction, when he made the first move to get up, he called himself well. Jesus operated in this principle in all of his ministry. He tried to teach us to operate in it. And then religion came along and made it hard and tried to say that it's some great spiritual truth he's trying to get over to us when Jesus was teaching the practical application of God's principle in God's law in your everyday life. Talk to things. Speak to them and call them the way the Word says they should be. Talk to your property. Pray over it and call it soul. Tell it, who you impress somebody. Somebody's impressed with you. Not just because you said it, but because the Word of God says it to you. Almost every piece of property I've sold, and I've dealt in real estate for several years, kind of as a sideline, and almost every piece of property I've bought and sold the last five to seven years, I, I talked to it, I called it, and it came. Then I talked to it, speak to it, pray over it, confess the word of God over it, over it, and it'll sell. Now see, these are practical things. God is practical. So when you call the things that you have, you're not operating in the principle that Jesus operated in. He always called things that were not. He called it. And when he prayed the prayer in the, in the 17th chapter of John, he stood there right before the disciples. He said, Father, I thank thee that I'm no more in this world. Hey, man, they're looking at him eyeball to eyeball, and he said, I'm not in the world. What's he doing? He's calling things that are not. Not only did he say that, you know what he had the audacity to say to his father, God, I have finished the work you gave me to do. Now, he hadn't even gone to the cross. What are you going to do with a guy like that? I'll tell you what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to follow his footsteps. Amen. And I'm going to say the things that he said, follow the principles that Jesus said. If anybody knew how to call things that were not as though they were, Jesus knew how to do it. Now see, if you just read the Bible with religious ideas, you'll never catch that. But in all of Jesus' ministry, he operated in the principle of calling things that are not as though they were.